just uh, just uh, a, a little bit random that this uh, that Cascadia went viral a few years ago in the New Yorker, and uh, those of us who work in this area, we thought everybody knew about this big earthquake maybe 10 or 15 years ago. It had been a Nova twice, a National Geographic half a dozen times, I think, and, and in, the, in the Oregonian every, every few months. So we thought, you know, the, the, the awareness side was really high, but then the New Yorker came out, and I'm a, I'm a West Coast person, and to me, the New Yorker is something that piles up in the dentist's office with some Manhattan-centric cartoons that usually I don't get or aren't that funny. Um, so the New Yorker meant nothing whatsoever to me. And then when it came out, though, uh, I learned that it's very influential. <laughs> and it, uh, it sort of went viral. And uh, my inbox and, and all of our inboxes just filled up with emails about everything from are we going to have a tsunami in Medford to a street address and am I going to be toast after this earthquake. So, uh, so we were completely wrong. The awareness level wasn't that high at all. And, um, it just captured the whole country. I wound up going to the New Yorker Festival and wound up giving a talk uh, in Manhattan at this performing arts center and the thing, even though I was sort of the warm up before the warm up before the warm up before uh, some, some really famous people were there. there. People showed up at 9 a.m. and filled the place up to hear about how Portland and Seattle were gonna be destroyed. And so, so it has caught people's attention. Uh, but anyway, so, whoops. Oh, good. I already got problems. So, but before we talk about earthquakes here, we have to talk about really how do we even know where this fault is? How do we know we even have a fault? How do we know any of this stuff? And um, rather than just leap into, straight into earthquakes, I want to talk a little bit about plate tectonics and the role that Cascadia played in it, and, uh, and then go from there. So, in 1960, Chile had an earthquake, a 9.5, which is the biggest ever recorded on Earth so far. And at the time, in 1960, uh, we really didn't know where earthquakes came from. And that may sound a little odd, and I'll come back to that later, but um, <clears throat> we're, we're not, uh, geological sciences were really kind of far behind most of the other sciences. And when this earthquake came around, luckily it didn't destroy any, any major cities, but it was a really, really big earthquake and had a tsunami to go with it. And, um, but it was just at that time that, that people were trying to figure out what, where earthquakes came from in the first place. You know, why were they, why were they, why do we have earthquakes? And in 1960, believe it or not, even though we had general relativity and all that, we, were, we really didn't know where earthquakes came from or why they happened, which sounds odd. But in the, in the, 30s, 40s, 50s, and into the 60s, we did begin to realize that earthquakes weren't just randomly spattered around the earth. They were concentrated in very narrow little bands, very well defined, and rarely did earthquakes fall out of outside any of these bands. So at least that part was known, but what those represented was not known in 1960. So going back even further, um, a guy named Alfred Wegener uh, proposed uh, what those things might be in 1912. And he was a meteorologist, and he got very curious about, um, about such things. And he noticed, like, people, people hadn't, before him had known that uh, the coasts of South America and Africa seem to more or less be parallel to each other. They fit together. And he'd noticed this and came up um, with an idea. And so here's a modern view of that. And you can see that they do, in fact, fit together uh, pretty well. 
And so this observation actually goes back to the 1500s when there were some maps that had come out then that proposed that they, they were very similar and might have fit together somehow. But going beyond just looking at this picture is hard. You know, how would you go about, you know, figuring this out? And the implications are kind of wild. The implications are that big continents move around on the Earth, and that was not a popular idea. We live on solid ground. It's made out of rock. It doesn't go floating around and bumping into other continents. Uh, but nonetheless, something happened. And so, um, <clears throat> so Wegener proposed that continents did in fact move around, and he set about to figure out how to, how to demonstrate that these were actually joined um, at one time, and not only just uh, Africa and South America, but everything. He proposed there was this thing called Pangaea, where all the continents were stuck together, and then they, you know, in the, in the Carboniferous period, hundreds of millions of years ago, and by the Eocene, about 40 million years ago, it looked like this, and um, in the present time, Quaternary, it looked more like we recognize it today. And so this was beyond outrageous. This was just crazy, crazy talk. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, Wegener set about to, to, to test this idea, and what he did is he looked at uh, fossils uh, across the continents, and he found that you could match up various uh, classes of fauna across some of these boundaries, and these were critters that can't swim. So it's pretty hard to explain that unless they somehow rocketed over and parachuted down on another continent. Um, which didn't seem like a practical idea. And so the simplest way to match up um, these fossils was simply to jam the continents back together again and, and look at these faunal affinities for latitudes and, and, uh, you know, and places. And, and it works. You can actually do it. And then he found some interesting uh, evidence. So he found that um, not only is Antarctica a uh, glaciated landmass it is as it is now, but there was evidence of glaciation in South America and South Africa and India and Australia, places that you know you wouldn't think of as as uh, glacier prone these days. Uh, but there are were in fact glaciers in um, Carboniferous to the Permian around 300 million years ago, and not only was there evidence of it, but it gives evidence of the direction of the movement of, of the glaciers. So they scratch the ground, and you can tell which way was forward from the, from the way the scratches work. And so these, these um, arrows show the sort of radial pattern of scratches coming out from some point, and the point was Antarctica. So apparently this is a second line of evidence that these things were all joined somehow um, 300 million years ago. And so here's, um, here's actually the first proposal. This, this is from 1596. So Wegener wasn't the first. He was just the first to really propose detailed tests of this idea. But here's a map from, from 1596. And then several people, uh, both cartographers, you know, proposed this. So Ortelius and Pellegrini um, noticed the fit. And there it is. You can see it. So, <laughs> how fast did this happen? I mean, if, was it like this? Really? So, <clears throat> so in 1912, uh, Wegener put out his uh, put out a paper, and uh, it was a pretty outrageous, pretty outrageous, well, extremely outrageous idea. And so in, uh, in 1925, here's an article from the New York Times about how this test was going to be done. And the test was to try to determine whether continents were moving using uh, radio waves. And I don't know the details of how this test was done, uh, but there was an attempt. So it's, well, even though it was outrageous, it was still needed some explanation. So they tried this, and it, it failed. And so... Uh, as it turns out, the method didn't have the resolution to see the continents moving because they were too, it was too, um, they were moving too slowly. But, the, but nevertheless, sometimes when you test something, you don't realize you're testing the test, and when it fails, 
you wind up thinking that the idea failed and not just the test. And this, this happens in science all the time. People are really convinced that their plan is going to work, and when it doesn't work, they go, aha, this hypothesis failed when it was actually only the method that failed. So, uh, so in 1925, this, this thing was considered dead. And to make it worse, Wegener was a meteorologist. And scientists, uh, we all live in little silos, and we don't listen to people that are outside our, our silos. And so geologists didn't listen to Wegener at all. He was, a, he was a frigging meteorologist. So when he's talking about rocks and faunal affinities and, and fossils and doing all the right things, they kind of just blew him off and said, well, you know, this talk would never be accepted at a geological society meeting. So anyway, so he had that bit of a stigma working against him. But then, in the 1940s, something, something revived the idea of continental drift, and believe it or not, it was U-boats that did it. Not directly, but... Well, how could that be? What do U-boats have to do with continental drift? Well, it turns out that World War II, uh, in, in the early days, wasn't going particularly well for the Allies, and the U-boats the, uh, were sinking a lot of ships crossing the Atlantic. And so there were a lot of Allied ships looking for U-boats out there. And one way to look for a U-boat, if it's not at the surface, is to tow a magnetometer. And that way you can detect submerged U-boats. And today they do the same thing by throwing off sono buoys and magnetometers in airplanes. But uh, back then they would tow magnetometers across the Atlantic, uh, searching for these U-boats. And, and as they were doing this, they were also making topographic maps of the Atlantic as they went, um, systematically looking for these U-boats. And, and this is sort of what they look like. So these, these uh, black squiggles are bathymetric profiles across the Atlantic. Here's the eastern side, here's the western side, and here's sort of a lump in the middle. And this lump in the middle is sort of a persistent thing. It appears in, in all of the pro profiles. And so the people that were doing this work were uh, were in the Navy, but they were also oceanographers. They were scientists. And so they were, even though they were hunting for U-boats, they were kind of curious about this odd sort of mountain thing in the middle of the Atlantic. And so later on, um, they took all that data and, and drew a, a really awful looking map that's almost completely indecipherable. But, but it has this row of mountains down the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. And this began to attract some attention. And then later on, that, those maps were turned into something beautiful like this. And you probably, how many people remember seeing this in National Geographic in the, in the 60s? Okay. So they turned, the, this, is a, this is a painting, but it's a painting based on data. And when these started to come out, um, this is a bit, a bit later, but people began to have some awareness that the, the, the ocean wasn't just the blue area on the map. There was actually stuff going on there. And here's this odd mountain range running up the middle of the Atlantic. And so as, as our knowledge of the topography and bathymetry of the world began to grow, it's, the picture started to look more like this. This is a modern view, but there's that mid-Atlantic ridge right there. And there are these other ridges out here. There's another one. There's another one. And I'll be darned if these ridges didn't line up with earthquakes. So Wegener's hypothesis began to come back slowly. And people were going, you remember that guy? <laughs> he had passed away in the, in the 1930s, went back to meteorology and sort of passed away in obscurity. But people started to remember this, this idea. And now we have mid-ocean mountain ranges that have rows of earthquakes on them that explain at least part of uh, that weird uh, linear pattern of earthquakes that we see around the globe. And so a couple of the people um, who contributed to investigating this a bit more were uh, Fred Vine and Drummond Matthews. This is a, a photo from 1970. But in 1960, um, they got interested in not only the topography and bathymetry and the mountain range, um, but they also got interested, remember they were towing magnetometers for U-boats, and uh, 
occasionally they would find new boats, but what else they found was interesting magnetic patterns on the seafloor. And so what they found was that the polarity of the Earth's um, magnetic system would reverse from time to time, and that was sort of known already. But what they found is that you could map this on the seafloor, which you really shouldn't be able to do, because nothing's moving, everything's static, and it should just, um, minerals that are magnetized on the Earth should just be staying where they are. But what they found instead was that these stripes represent reversals of the Earth's magnetic um, field, and they're symmetrical. They're symmetrical about this line here, and so these tan ones are the same magnetic pattern and same age as on both sides of this thing, and these green ones are the same age on both sides and so on. And, well, that can't be because that implies that the Earth's crust is young in the middle and older as you get out here toward the green colors, and that it came symmetrically out of this place somehow and moved away from it getting remagnetized as it was formed. So these rocks are basalt, they're volcanic rocks, they come out of volcanoes, so that kind of implied there was a long linear volcano that was spewing out basalt and it was getting remagnetized each time the Earth's field flipped. But not only that, the whole crust was being conveyor belted away from the center point and remagnetized each time. Well that can't happen because we live on a fixed Earth where stuff doesn't move around. But apparently, here's a place where some stuff moved around quite a bit. And so this is, you know, this is our Cascadia coast here. And so this, these aren't trivial distances. This is something like 200 miles. And so these guys wrote a paper, and they, they called it seafloor spreading. And they said, well, apparently, new seafloor is being created at this point, and it's spreading to the southeast and to the northwest at a rate of a few centimeters a year. And so they have a, there's a magnetic time scale, and this all got involved with drilling the oceanic crust and so forth. And so there were times associated with these uh, reversals. And so this had been going on for millions of years, apparently, moving along at a few centimeters a year. And it was called seafloor spreading. So, so now we have a couple of pieces of a puzzle, maybe. We have a mid-ocean ridge that seems to be populated with earthquakes, and at least one point on Earth where the mid-ocean ridge seems to be spewing out new material that's getting wider and wider and wider and creating new crust. Hmm. The plot thickens. And so as time went on, this, was ni this paper came out in 1961, and so people started zooming around, getting more magnetic patterns, more mag towing more magnetometers across these mid-ocean ridges, and they started to find something really similar to this. And remember, this is Cascadia. We'll come back to Cascadia. Uh, so seafloor drilling, anyway, demonstrated the age of, the, uh, of these stripes and the, and the rate that this was happening at. So there's seafloor spreading, this new idea, 1961. And so here's just a kind of a schematic of, of how this works. Here's a new crust being formed here. And as it conveyor belts to the right and left, the new, um, as, and as the magnetic field reverses from time to time, you get reversed patterns in dark and light and, and uh, normal patterns as we have today in, in the light color. So right about that time, remember we started in 1960 big earthquake in Chile. No, people had no idea why that happened. But by 1964, there was an idea. So this idea of seafloor spreading had morphed into something called plate tectonics. And they basically revived Alfred Wegener wholesale, accepted his whole story. And, uh, and it was called plate tectonics. And it involved the seafloor spreading, the volcanoes, and the, and the, and the um, earthquakes along the ridges. And a, and, a new, and a new paradigm was born um, in the range, in a very narrow time range from basically 1960 to 1964 or so. And then we had a really big earthquake in Alaska, a 9.2. So tied for second, second biggest ever recorded. Very similar to um, 
uh, the Chilean earthquake. It generated a tsunami. Uh, the 64 earthquake uh, tsunami actually killed a few people camping on the Oregon coast, did a lot of damage at, at um, Crescent City and so forth. And of course, did a lot of damage in Anchorage. This is downtown uh, Anchorage where there were a lot of odd kind of landslides, land failures um, like this, leaving big potholes. And so today we would look back at this and go, oh, well, of course, this is what we now call a subduction zone earthquake. But in 1964, this is a brand new hypothesis, brand new, and people argued about it. And so there were two guys who had a very public, uh, very public argument about this. Um, a field geologist, a brand new, newly minted field geologist named George Plafker and a very, uh, a very prominent uh, seismologist named Frank Press. And so George was a field geologist. So he went out in his wife beater coat and his field vehicle and his shovel and just took measurements all around Alaska from this earthquake. And what he found was that all along the outer coast, the coast had been uplifted by a lot, not a few centimeters, but meters, whole islands came out of the water. And then further inland, Back in here, he found that the coast had subsided. So whole forests were, were now bays. Uh, there's a famous picture of a gas station under, you know, underwater that's actually still there. And so the coastline had apparently tilted. It had gone up in the west, or on, up in the southeast and down in the northwest. And it was a big scale tilting spread out over 100 miles or so. So he said, well, this looks to me like um, a big shallow process that happened that tilted the land while it generated this big earthquake. And it's too long of a story to tell today, but when, you, when seismologists look at earthquakes, um, they generate what's called a focal mechanism, which tells you about what kind of earthquake it was. And they knew how to do this in 1964, even though plate tectonics didn't quite exist. And so one possibility was what they call a shallow thrust fault, where one plate is diving underneath the other, but in seismology there's an, there's an ambiguity and it can always be, there's always a 90 degree solution that's 90 degrees different from, from that. And so the other possibility was a very high angle fault that came up through the crust and that's what Frank Press believed it was. So George Plafker and Frank Press had a very public argument about a shallow thrust fault versus a steep fault uh, in the crust. And it was basically plate tectonics versus the old, the old school. That's what it came down to. And the field, the brand newly minted field geologist versus the very well-respected um, seismologist in a nice suit and tie, as they tend to wear. And so, let's see. Anyway, this, this debate kind of raged on, and it turned out that uh, George Plathker, the new guy, won. And... Uh, um, all the field evidence suggested a very shallow dipping plate uh, essentially underneath Alaska and his model fit the new thing of plate tectonics and so basically at, at, um, in 1964 this debate kind of sealed the fate of, of the, theor <clears throat> the theories that came before which were not that great and so Alfred Wegener was now a hero and plate tectonics was born and so this is kind of a funny thing to talk about in, you know, looking at all of you folks and even me, we were all alive when this happened. This wasn't some great discovery centuries ago. This just happened a few decades ago. And now we have this new model for plate tectonics, how, how the plates actually move around the earth and, um, and how, uh, I always love the part how uh, George Plafker uh, just stuck to his guns kept showing his field data, kept showing it again and again and again, and said, okay, you explain this some other way, and George was right. And uh, George is a friend of mine, and he's still alive and still doing great work. So, now we know this thing called thrust fault, and this is what a thrust fault is, just shoving one block underneath, under, underneath another. But this is, this is not just your homegrown thrust fault. We have one called, just like it called the Corvallis Fault that's in the West Hills of Corvallis. This is a really big thrust fault. This is shoving the entire Pacific plate underneath, uh, in this case, Japan. 
And so, um, but one of, the, one of the things that plate tectonics explained first uh, was those linear bands of earthquakes. We now can explain the linear bands of earthquakes down the mid-ocean ridge, but we can also explain the linear bands of earthquakes around every uh, continental margin that has active tectonics. So some do and some don't. Um, we don't have any earthquake bands along the East Coast or along, the, along Europe uh, because there are no subduction zones there. But this giant type of thrust fault is called a subduction zone. Here's Japan. And here's the band of earthquakes. And not only is it along the coast, but you can see that it, it follows a pattern of the Pacific plate uh, dipping into the mantle. And so this had been observed by seismologists before, but they had no idea what it meant. And now it became clear that some plates were diving underneath other plates and creating a lot of friction along their contact. And <clears throat> this also explained almost simultane simultaneously why Chile had the biggest earthquake and Alaska had the second biggest earthquake. It's because earthquake size depends on surface area. So the area that ruptures in the crust, the bigger it is, the bigger the earthquake you're going to have. And a shallow, a shallow dipping surface like this has so much surface area that the surface area is basically unlimited. You can have this be 100 miles wide, and you, can have, you could theoretically have an earthquake that ran all the way from Japan up to Kamchatka, around the Aleutians, and, and down into Canada. So the length is also unlimited. So it means that, that thrust faulting and these types of earthquakes are going to be the biggest earthquakes that we have. Everything else sort of pales in comparison. We may not have recorded the biggest earthquake that, that the Earth is capable of yet. And that's a little bit scary because we've had some really big ones. So so where, how does Cascadia fit into this? So Cascadia wasn't involved in the, the hunt for U-boats that so much. They were looking for Japanese submarines. but. There was data out there, and so that paper from Vine and Matthews helped, Cascadia helped launch plate tectonics. And, and then everybody sort of forgot about Cascadia. When plate tectonics came about, uh, people zoomed around the world and studied places like Japan and South America and Alaska. And every place the scientists went was a new place that fit the new plate tectonics model. Like, aha, here's another subduction zone, and another one. And, and everything just seemed to, to knit together in a short period of time with, with no failures of this new hypothesis. And in science, you test your hypothesis again and again and again. And this one got tested and tested and tested and didn't fail any tests. But on the other hand, if you want to score well on a test, don't ask too many hard questions. <laughs> So Cascadia was a place that immediately became uh, a, a sort of class of one, a place that fit the model in many ways. It had the magnetic stripes, it helped prove seafloor spreading, but there was one little tiny problem with Cascadia. Anybody guess what it is? Hmm? No big earthquakes, right. So. Whoops. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Sorry about that. So, if Cascadia is a subduction zone, where's this? And Cascadia was the only big subduction thrust fault in the world that seemed to be just dead silent. So, what do you do when you run into a problem like that? Well, let's go work on this other thing. This would be more fun, you know. <laughs> And everybody, we all do the same thing. We step around the, the elephant in the corner and go, we'll come back to that. So we don't have the uh, plane of landward dipping earthquakes, um, but it does seem to have a row of volcanoes. And those volcanoes are associated, not the yeah, submarine ones, the land ones, the cascades. And every subduction zone also has a row of volcanoes, which are just melted sediments basically coming back up after they've been dragged down. And so, um, what were people thinking about this in the, in the 60s, 70s, through the middle 80s? Well, there's Vine and Matthews map again. So, 
So seafloor spreading was demonstrated here, but it's, it's got its limitations. It, this, can't, this map can't tell you that it's spreading right now. It can tell you that it was spreading up to the last magnetic reversal, roughly half a million years ago. And below half a million years, it doesn't, the map doesn't have any resolution. So one thing people were thinking is, well, maybe it just stopped, you know. And as plate tectonics marched on, there were places around the world where there were plate fragments where subduction had stopped or seafloor spreading had stopped. And it just sort of stranded a fragment and the action moved somewhere else. So we sort of knew that was a possibility. So one possibility is um, that it just stopped and everything was kind of frozen in place. And it had been active up to a half million years ago and then just sort of conveniently stopped right about where the resolution ended. Yeah, so here's that. And so um, we know that this is possible, um, but what about other things? So here's a map of Cascadia earthquakes, and you can see that out here, the line between the dark and the blue, um, uh, the dark blue and the light blue, is the plate boundary between North America, or thought to be, between North America and uh, the Juan de Fuca plate. And it is really quiet. There's a few little earthquakes here and there. Very quiet. Some earthquakes up in Puget Sound, but then a lot of earthquakes down here. A lot of earthquakes in this part of the plate and here and here. So it actually had direct evidence that seafloor spreading was going along the ridge. That's what, that's what these are. And connecting segments called fracture zones or faults connecting these um, spreading ridge segments. And they were very active too. Here's one called the Blanco fracture zone. Here's the Mendocino fracture zone. So these are parts of a system, you know, that leg bones connected to the ankle bone and so on. And so even though this part seemed very quiet, the other parts of the system were, were very busy. And you read today, you'll read earthquakes about earthquakes off the Oregon coast. They're usually at about 126 west. And so we know every couple of weeks it'll appear in page five of the Oregonian or something. And, and people might even feel them down in Northern California, Southern Oregon. But so from that, we know that the system, at least these parts of the system, um, seem to be active. So we have a spreading ridge that's active. We have a volcanic range that seems to be active. And nothing put an, an explanation or an ex exclamation point on this uh, better than Mount St. Helens. So we knew the Cascades were active. You know, Mount Shasta had a small eruption in 1912. So in historic times, we even knew these were active. But you can kind of forget about things a little bit. And so in 1980, when Mount St. Helens went off, everybody went, oh yeah, that's right. So we have a completely active subduction zone system in every way that we can measure it, except one, the big earthquakes. And uh, so this became, this started to become more and more suspicious, like, wait a minute, this is, something's not right. And of course, this wasn't really news. We knew about Mount Mazama already. That was very well known. Uh, we knew about uh, Mount Shasta. We knew about Mount Lassen and so on. So it wasn't really news, but you know how it, it's easy to just push things aside when they don't seem to fit. But, you know, about 1980 or so, saying the thing is inactive was started to seem like a pretty untenable option with all the evidence out there. And so what about the low seismicity? Well, there's another possibility. Okay, let's say the whole thing is active. What if it's just aseismic? Well, aseismic is just a generic word for no earthquakes, but it, so it's obviously aseismic on a daily basis. But what if it's aseismic over the long term? Is that, is that even possible? And when you look around the world, if, if that were true, and there's really no fundamental reason that it couldn't be slip sliding away, somehow lubricated by something, um, but if it were, it would be the only subduction zone in the world doing that, so it, it needs a good explanation more than just something off the top of your head. Um, but so one way uh, that, that people thought of that wasn't really, it wasn't really out there as a, as a publication, but one possibility 
was that uh, we have a lot of sediment coming out into the system from the Columbia River, you know, very high sediment loads. And so we know that the sediment on the subducting plate is about three to four kilometers thick. It's very, very thick and very, very young and very, very wet. And so one idea was that, well, maybe you're just dragging all this wet sand and mud down into the system and there's nothing strong enough to really sustain um, the strain of having plates stuck the way they need to be for a big earthquake. And maybe it's just kind of lubricated with wet sand and mud. And, and that would actually fit all the data. You know, you could have it sliding away, you could have earthquakes out in the more distal parts of the system, the spreading ridges and the, and the fracture zones, and you could have active volcanoes because the plate was dragging the sediment down. You could have all of that and it would explain all the data, but nobody really had the guts to write that paper. <laughs> And so nobody did. So it just turned out to be, so as people stepped around the white elephant, it's like, yeah, that could work. But then things started to change. Uh, in 1984, uh, Heaton and Kanemori wrote an article and suggested that Cascadia had a lot in common with Chile and had a lot in common with Alaska, two places that had just had big earthquakes. And if you look at uh, Seattle and Portland and just imagine that what if they were sitting on top of a gigantic locked subduction zone fault and all of them built with no earthquake standards at all, it's like, that could be a problem. And basically their paper just compared Cascadia to some other subduction zones and just posed this idea, what if? They really didn't have much evidence to point at. It was a science article, not a popular article, but the evidence that they suggested might be consistent with this was pretty, pretty thin. But it, it did sort of turn people's heads a little bit, like, uh-oh, you know, we've been thinking aseismic subduction or, or stopped subduction. It's like, what if, what if these guys are right? And then I'm just going to flash forward a little bit. In uh, 1985, a Canadian geologist named John Adams wrote this little abstract. Here's the actual abstract here. It was from EOS, a geophysical journal uh, that goes with the big meeting we have every year in San Francisco. And he wrote this little abstract and he, he basically said in the bottom part of it, oops, um, that there were some things called turbidites, which are basically submarine landslide deposits that had been mapped out and investigated by people at uh, Oregon State in the, in the mid-1960s. Uh, it turned out to be my thesis advisor and his students, his first students, I was his last, and his first students had mapped these things out. And Adams said, you know, these might be evidence of big earthquakes. This is not just musing of seismologists, this is actual dirt, actual evidence that could have come from this. And he had some, some interesting arguments about this, and he kind of threw them out there in this little, um, in this little abstract that was uh, widely ignored by uh, virtually everybody. And he's never ever given credit for it, but he was actually the first guy to propose that there was evidence um, for great earthquakes. And let me see. Okay, so the first, um, the first bit of evidence, uh, the first half of his abstract was, was this, that the land in the, along the Cascadia coast, as measured by uh, highway survey crews, seemed to be tilting to the east at, at noticeably big rates. And so they survey these highways, you know, to get their positioning in and get the vertical gradients uh, down. And they've been doing this since the 1920s, and apparently in the, over that period of 50 to 60 years, the land was, the coast range was noticeably tilting to the east. And you can see these east tilts and at rates of a couple of millimeters a year, which is geologically, they may not sound like much, but a couple millimeters a year, if you continued that out for millions of years, you would have a gigantic mountain range with snow on top. And we don't have that. We just have kind of a, a low, low elevation coast range. So what that implies is tilting and uplift of the coast range at high rates can't go on forever. Otherwise, we'd have the Himalayas out there. So if it can't go on forever, what happens in the future? Well, it has to come back down somehow. And the best way to get it back down again is have a big earthquake. And so they proposed that this was evidence of 
uh, what's called elastic storage of strain energy, sort of like the winding up of a spring. If we crank this up, the coast range goes up at high rates between earthquakes, and then you release it, and it all snaps back during the earthquake. So that was the first, um, the first thought about that. And here's just, a, um, here's just a more modern view of what that tilting looks like. And you can think of, this is again hard to think of where we live on the solid ground and hard rocks. Think of them, uh, we think of them uh, more like blocks of rubber. And the North, America, North American plate will just bow upward, just like a block of rubber, just it's, it's quite weak actually geologically. And so this bowing upward is measurable. And these are the modern measurements of it. This is the offshore part, so there's no measurement out there. Um, but this is what it looks like, and this, that early paper was measuring the eastern part of that, of that tilt. And then, of course, there's always uh, counter-arguments to every, everything you could say or publish, and so there was a bunch of confusing back-and-forth papers arguing that the same data represented either an earthquake or another group said it represents uh, not an earthquake, and sort of like al um, alternative facts. Um, but then in 1987, Brian Atwater uh, published a first paper uh, showing evidence along the coast. And his evidence was, uh, so John Adams' evidence was submarine landslides, and Brian Atwater's evidence was submerged parts of the coastline, so entire marsh systems that seem to have dropped down quickly. And we'll loop back to this in, a, in a part two, but... Um, <clears throat> And then here's, the, here's just some detail of what uh, submarine landslide deposits look like, and I'll come back to that in more detail also. But the crux of Adam's story uh, was this. So you can't look at one of these landslide deposits and go put your finger on it and go, ah, oh, this one came from an earthquake. This one, though, is just a random landslide. There's no way to actually do that. So what he noticed, though, was that um, the Mazama ash from 7,600 years ago had spread all through the Pacific Northwest and was delivered by rivers uh, out to the deep sea and out to the edge of the continental shelf. And at some point it would get delivered into very deep water by these turbidity currents, the submarine landslides. And what, what Adams noticed was that along the Washington coast, and this is sort of a cartoon represent, representation of the Washington coast with the Columbia River here and spreading out and filling canyon heads along the Washington margin, and he noticed that uh, an odd thing could be seen, that a surprising number of these uh, core sites along the coast would see um, the same number of turbidites above this Mazama ash. So the Mazama ash was a nice time marker, and above that ash he saw 13 deposits in a number of different places that were separated by pretty big distances. And so if you think about alternatives, which is what we're trained to do, you'd have to go, well, how, how could that happen? If this is a mixture of, say, landslides and storms and earthquakes, maybe, you should see different numbers everywhere. But what Adam saw was not different numbers ever, everywhere. He saw the same number everywhere, 13, 13, 13, 13, along the coast. And so that was Adam's first sort of objective test of what this stuff was. And it's just the coincidence test. You know, it's not direct hardcore evidence that this came from an earthquake, but it's more like, okay, if this is an earthquake, so you explain how you get the same number all over the place. And uh, we'll, loop, we'll loop back to this a little bit more. So this is what he saw, similar numbers everywhere. And I'm just gonna leave a cliffhanger for now, I think. And uh, well, uh, I guess we got some time for discussion if you guys have questions. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, oh okay. <clears throat> yes, um, I noticed that after the Mexico earthquake, England um, had an earthquake with a 4.2 the next week or last week. Yeah. Uh, and I didn't know there was a fault under England and it didn't show on your map. <laughs> uh, what's the There's no connection, surely. 
uh, between the two countries, but I was just want to ask you how that happens if there's no fault. Well, if you had an earthquake, by definition, there is a fault. Uh, we just didn't know about it. And it doesn't, and faults don't necessarily come to the surface, and they don't necessarily come to the surface where you can see them very well. You could very well have a big fault directly under London, and it's been urbanized for so long that you'd never know it was there. Faults are much easier to map either at sea, where there are no, no forests and you can, you can image things easily, or out in the desert where you can just fly over it and, and see it. But when you get faults in either forested places or urbanized places, um, they're much tougher to deal with. And so, you know, you, so you just pointed out that one of the one of the problems with plate tectonics. And as the arguments went on, people said, "Well, you know, but not all the earthquakes are on on these narrow bands. There are a few scattered around. How do you how do you explain those?" And that argument is still going on. So, it, but it turns out basically that the Earth's continents, even though the most of the action is around the edges, they're all under some sort of stress um, as just being part of the Earth's system. So we have earthquakes in Virginia, we occasionally have earthquakes in England, those are really rare, um, and Sweden, and you know various places where there just shouldn't be much going on, but the crust is under some sort of stress and there's some sort of fault that we don't know about is basically the, the answer. Australia had a, a fairly f famous uh, earthquake in Newcastle that actually killed people you know, as far from any plate boundary as you can get. And we've had uh, earthquakes in New Madrid, uh, Missouri, in the middle of the middle of North America. No apparent reason, but there is a fault there, that's for sure. Yeah. Hey, over here on, the, on your right, I'm Bob. Yeah. So I've always been, uh, since I first heard this idea about uh, plate tectonics, curious about the issue of friction and so forth. And uh, I'll just frame the question this way. Why doesn't the um, spreading pop up right along the, uh, the uh, ocean ridge? Why doesn't it pop there? Why does it go down at the continental shelf? And why does it pop up in mountain ranges inward of the continental shelf? I'm, I'm something is causing resistance in the, uh, the relative resistance and uh, fr friction and flow is changing throughout the whole process of movement. Can you yeah. give some idea of what's going on there? Um, basically, the simple way to explain all that is think of a lava lamp. You know, so the, 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 the light bulb is heating up that whatever oil or wax or whatever it is, and it floats to the top, and then it eventually cools and sinks. And that's essentially what's going on inside the Earth. So we have a molten core, and it's heating the mantle from below. And um, so, it's, so, so hot material is rising, just like the lava lamp. It comes out at the mid-ocean ridges. But then as it forms new crust, it immediately starts to cool. And as it cools, it gets heavier, and it starts to sink. And the oceanic crust itself is much, um, it's basalt, so it's much heavier and denser than the continental crust made out of granitic-type rocks. So we kind of think, you have to think about continents as sort of the scum floating on top of the lava lamp, really. It's the, so we live on scum our entire, our entire existence. And so the continents are these little blobs of scum floating on top of this giant convection cells in the mantle, the same kind of convection cells you have going in your coffee cup with the foam, the foam floating on top. We are the foam. And so the material cools and densifies and, and eventually winds up sinking again. And the, and the lighter rocks never sink. They're, they always stay on top regardless of what the oceanic crust is doing. Um, the way you get some of this stuff in big, up in big mountains is when continents collide. So when you have a subduction zone that brings two continents together, eventually they collide and, and big mountains will form then. And sometimes some of those oceanic rocks will get caught up in the mountain forming. So in the Himalayas, which is basically India ramming into China, um, there are basaltic oceanic rocks up in those mountains that were caught up in that whole, that whole system. I hope that helps. Yeah. Um, over the past 20, 25 years, we've had a series of small earthquakes out of the Scotts Mills area. Mm -hmm. And are those earthquakes part of what you described uh, with the tilting uh, by the pressure, or is that its own fault line? Yeah, so they're, they're definitely part of the subduction system. 
and so I, I kind of simplified a lot of a lot of things and so there's, there's a lot more going on than just the tilting so the tilting is elastic and it'll tilt to the east and then it'll snap back during the big earthquake but also uh, the Juan de Fuca plate is subducting not straight on but at an oblique angle it's going to the northeast and what that does is it, it tries to drive Oregon to the north basically in, in Canada uh, in British Columbia, that part of North America is pretty well fixed and it's resisting that. So Oregon and Washington are colliding as they're being pushed by the subduction into Canada and all the faults that you're talking about, the one in Puget Sound and the Scotts Mills earthquake and the ones in Portland, they're all related to the sort of crunching of Oregon and Washington into Canada. And so we have uh, faults around even the Salem area that nobody knows anything about, but uh, and, and, and in the Tualatin Valley and the West Hills faults and all of those, and the and I showed you the the um, there were some earthquake uh, in, earthquakes in Puget Sound, which is much more active. So that part of the system is a bit weaker, and kind of like when you saw through a branch part way, it's going to break where it's already part way sawn through. And so Seattle, the Seattle area, unfortunately, happens to be sitting on the weakest part of the plate, and so in that collision, it's crunching just a lot more than than Oregon does. But we do have these occasional little earthquakes. Uh, yep. With global warming and the redistribution of massive amounts of water weight, does that have any effect? Well, my, my first inclination is to say no, uh, but as sea level changes, it does change the loading levels, you know, on faults just a little bit. And so it, it might have a, a small effect. Um, but probably not a big one, my guess. Yep. Uh, my name is uh, David. I'm an ex-seaman. I once worked on board the oceanographer, and we were pulling the magnetometer back and forth across the ocean ridge off of uh, Washington. Very interesting. And uh, <laughs> one of the things they determined was that the magnet magnetism flips. And I was wondering, do you know what causes that? Because <laughs> that's, a, that's a very unusual thing. Most people don't even realize that the variation changes like that. Yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, yeah, you're right. So what, you're, what he's saying is, so variation is the difference between the magnetic direction and, the, and, and true north, the geographic north pole. And it changes quite a bit. And it's right now in the middle of changing pretty fast. And so some people think we're about to have one of these magnetic flips. And it's a long story, but the, the magnetic field is, is uh, it's called a dynamo. So we have basically magnetic rocks in the core that are liquid. And if you have liquid magnetic stuff moving around, it generates this big, it's what generates the big field, the magnetic field. And the Van, Al Van, Al Van Allen belts you know, out in space are related to this. And it's a good thing they're there because we wouldn't have an atmosphere <laughs> if they weren't. Uh, but what causes it to flip? You know, I see paper after paper after paper modeling how it flips, but not a single really good explanation of why it flips. So we can model the details and constrain a lot of things, but why it does that, it is really weird behavior, right? You're right. I have no idea. So, you know, the Earth is still holding back a lot of, uh, a lot of her mysteries. So yep. looks like a good time for a 10 minute break right now. And we'll be back to, uh, if you run out and buy razor blades for your wrists right about now. <laughs> okay, welcome back for the somewhat more depressing part of the story. <laughs> and, you know, when earthquakes happen, the, the, it's, it's no longer a, a sticky note like, oh, I should do something about this. It just happens when it happens. So I feel kind of obligated to point out the exits. <laughs> 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 They don't have any overwing exits, we just have the tail exits back there. Um, the last earthquake I was in was in Japan in 2011, and we were in the middle of a, a meeting, just like this one, with somebody was changing with a thumb drive, changing speakers, and the, and the Tohoku earthquake went off uh, just as we were doing that. And so it just always reminds me that it's just when, you're, when you run out of time, that's when you run out of time. Um, so anyway, the exits are back there. Uh, nine. Um, so, how many how many of you guys watch The Big Bang Theory? Okay, everybody likes it. 
So you know that, that Sheldon now and then kind of rags on geology is not a real science. It's not like particle physics. It's, you know, it's just not quite a real science. And as a geologist, I have to say that Sheldon is absolutely right. <laughs> so when I was walking down the hallways in high school and I was watching the biologists pick apart frogs and the physicists playing with blocks on sandpaper and the, and the chemistry students blowing, having little explosions, I saw the geologists were putting coolers in the back of a station wagon and heading out. And I went, I'm going with those guys. <laughs> That looked a lot more fun. And that led to beer drinking and so on. So basically geology, um, that might be why geology is 200 years behind the other sciences. I'm not sure. <laughs> but however that happened, it, it definitely happened. And ju just to, I, I kind of like to think about it in, this, in these terms. My dad was one of those 400,000 engineers who worked on Apollo. So when I was growing up, I was hearing about this stuff all the time. And he would, brought, he would bring home the neatest show and tell stuff you know, for my class that you could ever come up with from JPL and from, and from Kennedy Space Center. And so I, so I, I kind of, Apollo is kind of a, a time marker for me. It's like the most advanced thing humans have ever done, arguably. In, um, in 1969, and plate tectonics in 1969 was like six years old. And all the explanations for all the stuff we just talked about earlier um, were basically amounted to the stork brought it, you know, as far as how the earth worked. They made no sense whatsoever, but they were dutifully in, you know, enshrined in all sorts of textbooks, some of which I read as an undergrad, and because they were still being used in the early 70s. And they really just made no sense whatsoever. And plate tectonics just kind of cleared the floor and, and set everybody straight. And here, interestingly enough, is um, an astronaut on Apollo 12 setting up a seismometer, soon to be recording the first moon quake as the um, Apollo 12 uh, lunar module uh, ascent stage uh, crashed into the moon when they discarded it. So uh, meanwhile, uh, back in Cascadia, we've kind of seen the background, some of the background for this. And I mentioned that Can uh, Canadian geologist uh, John Adams had first proposed that these submarine landslide deposits were maybe from, from earthquakes. And we're going to look a little bit more closely at that. And so and then in 1987, uh, Brian Atwater found these deposits along the coast that, it, that look like this. And so, this may not look like a big deal, but what, what we're seeing here is, um, this is Willapa Bay, and this is the current marsh environment up on top. And then below that, you have some gray kind of mud, and then below that you have some sand. Below that you have peat, and peat is just um, uh, uh, decomposed marsh plants. And below that you have some sand, and then so on. And so Brian started poking at this and wondering about this. And the, the original attraction was, and, Mar and Brian was original, so originally sort of a marsh ecologist. So he looked at this and went, well, wait a minute. These plants up here, they're extremely sensitive to sea level and salinity. And, the, and so, and these plants down here, the older ones, they're the exact same plants as that are on top. But this is, this is about a meter in between. And they really can't tolerate that much difference in tide level. You're either you're, these plants either need to be here or they need to be there, but not both. And so this attracted his attention. And so, you know, one, one thing you could say is, well, maybe sea level changed by a meter, and that would explain this. The former sea level and marsh surface would be down here, and then sea level rose a meter, and then you have the marsh on top. No problem. Uh, the problem was, though, that this turns out to be around 300 years old, and you would have had to raise sea level by a meter in 300 years. And even though sea level is rising today at a couple of millimeters a year, and now accelerating from global warming, um, 300, a, a meter in 300 years was just a bit too fast. You really couldn't, that really didn't make sense. And since this change was vertical, you couldn't really explain it just by moving channels around and things like that. It really had to be vertical motion. And so, um, so Brian thought, well, you know, there's got to be some explanation for this. So he started poking at this, and what he found was 
that the plants, the old plants in the 300-ish year old layer were um, uh, not only buried by the sand, but they were buried in growth position. So the, they were sticking up and the sand was entombed these plants that they apparently were covered by sand when they were alive. And that kind of, that kind of smacked of something that happened more quickly than, than a slow, gradual sea level rise. So, so we got very interested in this and started radiocarbon dating this layer and uh, found out it was you know, roughly 300 years old and then found out found some other interesting things. These divots in it, these turned out to be Native American fire pits. So this was the ground surface at some point with people living on it when, when it was kind of rapidly covered with sand. And then for some reason, it was then covered by mud. And this is intertidal mud. So this is, this is the kind of mud that you get deposited in Willapa Bay when the depth is a meter or more. So this was underwater. First, so the Indian site was covered with sand then covered with water for a while, and then here it is happily a marsh again where you can just go out with your little army shovel and dig it out. So, so something, something happened, something fairly dramatic that you wouldn't, you wouldn't necessarily know just from walking along a cut bank like this. And so what Brian proposed was that this land level change was, not, was actually a land level change and not a sea level change. The, sea, the sea stayed in the same place and the land went from this level to a meter lower fairly quickly, destroyed an Indian site and then was covered by a tsunami deposit. And once it was down a meter, it was now in the bay. And so this mud is just bay mud developed on top of all of that and then eventually it came back out of the water and formed the modern marsh on top. Well, I can tell you that was an outrageous hypothesis too. Nobody believed a word of this uh, when Brian first proposed it. And I, was, I was an undergrad student and I remember going on field trips and we'd go out to a spot like this and dig this stuff out for ourselves and people would kind of grumble off to the picnic benches and eat lunch going, nah, there's no way. That's, there's got to be some other explanation, which is what we're supposed to do is try to t pull something apart and make it fail. And this went on for a couple of years and, and Brian would just say, well, what's your idea? <laughs> then there was kind of silence, you know. But we would grumble anyway and say, no, that can't be right. But then in uh, about 1982 or three, a tsunami uh, sand sheet and evidence and written evidence was discovered in Japan. And in Japan, they've had written records, of course, that go back 1,200 years or more. Um, and so at the time that this happened, roughly 300 years ago, there were well-developed written records in Japan. And this was, um, so this tsunami arrived, but it was different than all the previous tsunami. Japan had been hit by big earthquakes and tsunamis for you know, as far back in time as anyone could remember. But this one was different. It arrived uh, with no earthquake. So tsunami is a Japanese word that means harbor wave, and this, this wave came in with no earthquake. And they were used to earthquake and tsunami pairs coming within minutes to hours of each other. This one just arrived with no warning at all. It did some damage along the coast, sunk some boats, uh, killed a few people, and was dutifully noted down in Japanese records as this mystery tsunami arriving. Uh, and so, in. In Japan, the records or the society was far enough along that they had uh, written records of the exact water heights in warehouses and how many rice bales were destroyed. And the reason was basically an insurance claim. They could go to the shogun and they could say, this natural disaster destroyed one and a half bales of rice in my warehouse, and they would get reimbursed uh, for the damage. And Unlike insurance claims of today, when we might just fudge a little bit about how much was damaged and get both sides of the car painted and so forth, um, the, the, the shogun penalties for that sort of thing were pretty severe back in the day. And so I doubt they exaggerated very much at all. They might have even under, you know, underdone it a little bit. And so, um, so this tsunami arrived in, uh, in the year 1700 in January. And we know so much about Cascadia today because we actually have the time of day that this arrived. And it's quite easy to back calculate timings. And so what, 
colleague Kenji Sataki did is he, he, looked at around, he looked around the Pacific Basin at all the other subduction zones and wondered where this tsunami might come from. And he tried Kamchatka, he tried the Aleutians, he tried Alaska, he tried uh, uh, Chile because uh, Chilean tsunamis had arrived in Japan before and they knew that was possible. But it really didn't fit the data. The water heights along the coast didn't match any of those places. The one place it did match, though, was the Pacific Northwest. And it was quite easy to reproduce the water heights uh, that they found in Japanese, along the Japanese coast. And so this data, and uh, so these, these uh, two groups went back and forth. Uh, the tree ring people and, and Brian Atwater, you know, had refined the date of this event uh, quite a bit. And they'd gotten it to within a couple of years of the year 1700. And David Yamaguchi, a tree ring guy, had gotten it down to even, even knowing that it was um, the winter of 1700, it had to be before the growth ring went on in the spring of 1700 and after the last growth ring went on in 1699. So it turns out that the Japanese records and back calculating the speed of the tsunami show that this last event occurred uh, January 26, 1700, about 9 p.m. So I would maybe take exception with Sheldon a little bit that we're starting to get better at this stuff. We may be 100 years behind, but we're starting to catch up. And so here's, um, so here's Brian Atwater in his preferred environment, um, digging out these uh, buried marshes in Willapa Bay. And one other thing that um, Yamaguchi and Atwater and others found was that, you've, and we've all seen this, you drive along the Oregon coast and you look up look off to the east in some of these estuaries and you see a lot of snag trees in the estuaries and you probably like me think nothing of it it's like oh there's some snag trees no biggie uh, but it turns out that a lot of these uh, trees are about 300 years old and were killed by the last tsunami and the reason they're still there is that the dug firs would would uh, rot away and so forth but the ones that are standing are typically western red cedars which is what we use for decks they have a lot of tannin, and they can actually survive 300 years standing up. And so Yamaguchi went out and started sawing some of these uh, trees apart and doing the tree ring work and found out that many of them were killed in the last uh, tsunami by saltwater intrusion. And so, um, so this work has come along a lot, working on the last couple of uh, earthquakes and tsunami deposits. And, oh, I forgot to mention, so from the tsunami work, let me go back the other way. Um, from the tsunami work, we know not only the date and time, but we actually know the rough magnitude. To match the water heights in Japan, this, work, this earthquake needs to be somewhere between 8.8 .8 and 9.2 in magnitude. So this is a big earthquake that can launch a damaging tsunami across the Pacific. And so here's sort of the, the nitty gritty of how this works. In, the, in a subduction zone, you have a very strong oceanic plate. And I, I mentioned that the continent is sort of, we're living on the scum. And so the, the Pacific plate, I mean the um, North American plate that we live on is quite weak and flexible compared to the, the strong basaltic subducting plate. And so when they get stuck like this, it's the North American plate that gives. So it goes up when, you, when you've got uh, the plates locked up and then during the earthquake, it releases right there and that big bulge goes away. And so you get uplift here and then during the earthquake, you get subsidence along the coast. And this big long wavelength um, change in shape of the North American leading edge is what generates the tsunami. It's about 100, 150 miles wide, a thousand, well, 700 miles long. And so in detail though, this is really exaggerated. Uh, luckily, it doesn't go up a kilometer and <laughs> come down a kilometer. This is only about a meter. So a vertical meter on, on the land is what we see. And so in detail, here's, here's your um, typical coastal marsh with the forest growing down to its salt tolerance level, which is you know a few feet back from the water, from high tide. And then you suddenly drop it into the bay by about a meter during the earthquake. And there it is. And then. 20, 30, 40 minutes later, the tsunami comes in, lays down a sand sheet, and within a couple of days, this tree will die from saltwater intake. 
And if it's a western red cedar, you may wind up with a snag like this that's rooted down not at the modern surface, but at the previous land surface down here. And then the sand and the mud uh, from, that's accumulated in the bay while it was down. And then during the next seismic cycle, it starts coming back up again. So you have a modern marsh again reestablishing at the same spot. And so this goes up and down and up and down and up and down through geologic time. And it just happens that you can record multiple events like this because the sea level overall is rising a little bit and it's leaving space to sort of make a stack of these things. Otherwise, it would just be the same spot going down and up, down and up, down and up. So in the marshes, you can, um, uh, with a little folding shovel, you can record about seven of these, which go back around uh, 3,500 years. So when you have an earthquake that big, a lot of things happen. So you, you drop the coastline a meter or so. You have landslides all over the Pacific Northwest. You have submarine landslides coming from the offshore as well. And so this is a cutaway at just about this latitude of uh, the subduction system. So we're over here in Salem about there. Here's the coastline. Here's um, uh, Cape Lookout. And so this is what the leading edge of North America looks like. And here's the Juan de Fuca plate subducting obliquely to the northeast at about 40 millimeters a year. So about the same speed as your fingernails grow. That's, as, that's And that's really fast for geology. <laughs> so, um, and then this lumpy blue area, what this is, you can kind of think of North America as sort of a snow shovel. And it's basically plowing off all the sediment that's coming out of the Columbia River and forming a, just a big kind of a snow pile at the, le at the leading edge of North America. Uh, but it's a, you know, it's a 40 million year old snow shovel and it's accumulated 50 miles worth of stuff. And, and this is it. So when the earthquake comes and the source of the earthquake we know now to be sort of in this red bar out here, it's mostly offshore. And so it, it does a lot of shaking and delivers sediment to the seafloor that we can use. So this is a turbidity current. You can create one of these at home. Your fish might be alarmed, but you can, you can do it. And all it is is just sand and mud rolling downhill, and eventually it runs out of steam and drops its, drops its sediment load. So there's, nothing, there's no great um, mystery about these things at all. And here's maybe, here's a sort of cheesy animation of what, whoops, I forgot to hit the button of what this might look like. This is a bathymetry of uh, Astoria Canyon. And so you might have a whole bunch of submarine landslides uh, coalesce and go down the hill uh, like this. And then if you took, whoops, got forward and backward mixed up here. So if you took all of Cascadia then and turned it on its side and shook it, it would look something like this. So these are the major canyon systems and these, were, these are turbidity currents coming down, speed it up a little bit, that's probably 24 hours worth of time. And so <clears throat> to use these things, this is kind of the science that I do, if, to use these for earthquakes, um, it's not so easy because the deposits could be from other things. And so part of the trick is to try to sort that out. And so uh, these things are called turbidites, and here they're collected on a ship with basically a, a 6,000 pound lawn dart with four inch sprinkler pipe and a big boat. And you cut that open and you get this stack of these things. And so they're relatively easy to capture if you have a big boat and, and 10,000 meters of wire and all that, all that stuff. The question is, what do they mean? And so this is where John, John Adams uh, comes in. So his so I told you a little bit about the sort of coincidence test. You know, what are the chances that you'd have these 13 turbidites in all these different places if you had multiple mechanisms going on? Storms, earthquakes, volcanoes, all these things going on. What are the chances? Well, so a, a coincidence like that is never very, uh, can't really survive in science very long. You need more than that. So what Adams did was he went beyond that a little bit. And here, so here's a core map showing some of the cores that, that he had available at the time. This is in 1989, 1990 timeframe. 
And so he wanted to know, really, if the one good way to tell earthquakes from everything else is if they were deposited synchronously. So all deposited at the same time everywhere, that would nail it pretty much. And no other, no other natural phenomenon could really do that. Uh, the problem was, though, radiocarbon gives you plus or minus maybe 50, 60, 70 years, which is not, that, not synchronous enough to, to really test it. So radiocarbon is out, in a, in a way, as a, as a test of earthquakes. And so he needed not 50, 60, 70 years, he needed minutes. And so how do you do that? How do you, something that's a few hundred or a few thousand years old, how, do you, how in the world could you tell that it was minutes apart from a deposit somewhere else? And so uh, what he did was he cheated. And he realized that he didn't really, we're kind of mechanistic and we tend to think of, I, want, I need to know how I can measure this to within minutes. And John is smarter than that. He realized he didn't need to know that at all. All he needed to know was whether they happened at the same time or not. It doesn't really matter what the clock said, just at the same time or not the same time. And so, so he, looked at this, um, he looked at this series of cores and the Mazama ash in more detail. And what he realized was that there was a confluence of channels. Here's a cartoon of it, but in real life it's up here. Here's the Juan de Fuca channel. I don't know how well you can see this blue, but the Juan de Fuca channel up here and the Willapa channel come together right there. And here's the cartoon of it. And what, so what he found was that this 13 turbidites above the ash occurs there, 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 there. And it also occurs in Astoria channel. And it also occurs on both sides of this confluence, so there, and up in there as well. So, but the headwaters of these things are 150 kilometers apart. So we had 13 turbidites there and 13 or 14, similar number coming down here. And then you had a confluence right there. And then it goes downstream and 200 kilometers downstream, you had still 13 turbidites. So there's only a couple of possibilities here, either you had 13 coming down one side and 13 coming down the other side at random times, and it just happened to be the same number. And then if that, case, if that were the case, you'd have 26 at the confluence, and then you go 200 kilometers downstream and you just happen to lose 13 along the way somehow. They just die out. That was one possibility. A lot of coincidences required. The other possibility is that all 13 got to this confluence at the same time within a few minutes and then kept going on downstream and left 13. And that turned out to be right. So John Adams, without ever going to sea, without ever seeing one of these cores, we actually faxed him the core logs. From, they're in the OSU core library. They're still there. And without ever opening a core, looking at a core, doing a radiocarbon date, John Adams figured out that the last 13 turbidites in Cascadia were great earthquakes covering a span of 7,000 years. So my hat's off to John Adams because he figured why, why do it the hard way when you can just cheat? <laughs> so we're not anywhere near as smart as John Adams, so we tried to do it the hard way. And here's a, a colleague in a van at, at sea. Here's a core sample in a, in a scanner that collects all sorts of physical properties from the core. So this is going to be the gnarly, sciencey part of the talk, so hang in, hang in there with me, and I'll show you what this, what this means. So we basically, a colleague of mine, in fact, a colleague from OSU named Hans Nelson, um, he didn't believe John Adams' story. And the reason he didn't believe it was that he did his PhD thesis on the Astoria submarine fan. So right in the middle of the area that Adams uh, was hypothesizing about, Hans had actually worked there for five years, looking at every single core, collected all the raw data, collected some of the data that Adams used. Adams had never gone there. And Hans was sort of like, who is this guy? This makes no sense at all. I don't think there are 13 turbidites out there. I think they're just random numbers. So we wrote a proposal to the National Science Foundation to go disprove John Adams. Uh, Hans Nelson and I did. And that's what we tried to do. So here we are in our first cruise with some core samples on this scanner, doing it sort of the modern way um, many years later. And uh, so even later than that, we began using other methods uh, with the cores. This is a CT scanner, which we luckily have one of the best CT systems in the valley uh, at the vet med school at OSU. 
and they happen to be located across the street from the core lab. So we line up behind the horses and the iguanas and get our cores scanned uh, at the vet med school. Um, but anyway, the method we used, um, we, we, like Adams, found pretty much right off that the Mazama ash, sure enough, did occur in the 13th turbidite down just about everywhere we went. And so, since we were there to prove, disprove John Adams, we were in a little bit of trouble right off the bat <laughs> because it looked, kind of was looking like he was right. And the, re the way we found this out was that, um, and uh, the gentleman here who was on the oceanographer may have seen something similar to this, but at sea, the scientists usually give a, uh, a show and tell uh, for uh, the ship's crew during the cruise about what, what science they're doing, what's going on, why are we here, what's this all about. And so when we're processing cores during this cruise, we're, we'd process one, we'd put it away in a freezer, and we'd process another one and put it away in the freezer. And we'd see these cores one at a time. But then it came time to give a, give a talk to the ship's crew, and we had to pull them all back out again, put them on display, and then come up with a PowerPoint about what, what we were doing there. And the plan was to basically talk about what we'd written in the proposal, how it's crazy to think this is all earthquakes and there are different numbers of turbidites everywhere and it just it doesn't make any sense at all. John Adams was wrong. And we pulled all the cores out and looked at them and, and we realized uh, about an hour before this presentation that John Adams was right. <laughs> so Hans and I just looked at each other and said, what are we going to say? <laughs> it's, like, it's like nobody here has read the proposal. They're not going to know. And so, <laughs> Um, so we gave John Adams' story on the, while we were still at sea, and uh, I sent an email to John Adams from the ship, which was like a brand new thing at the time. Oh, we can send email from the ship. And I sent him one, and I said, you were right, yeah, because he was. And so what we, what, so I never, in, I was never um, scheduled to be a paleoseismologist. I thought we were going to do this project and go on to and kind of dismiss the whole Adams hypothesis, and I'd go on to other things. Um, but that was 1999, and I'm still doing it. And so I'll just show you a little bit of the way, the way it's done today. And these, are, uh, these are core diagrams, and basically we borrowed methodology from, um, from the oil industry. So the gas in your car today was basically found by a technique called well log correlation. And this is a well log correlation plot. And it turns out that the, not the source rocks, but the reservoir rocks that they drill for in the North Sea and the Gulf Coast on the Alaskan Slope, they're all turbidites, the same kind of stuff we're using. And so there are a lot of people in the world that know a lot more about turbidites than we do because they do this all day, every day. And if they don't do well at it, they get fired. So it's kind of a severe, <laughs> a severe test of their skills. But what happens is they drill holes, they drill an oil well, and they log the hole with electronic tools that produce information about the rocks. And so this is, these wiggles on the left, this is the density of the sand and mud, and on the right in the dark blue is the magnetic properties of it, how magnetic it is. And basically what these are are just proxies for grain size. So when you see it kick out, that means sand, and when it's in here skinny, that means mud. So each one of these things where it's sticking out, these kicks, these are all the turbidites. And so we basically borrowed their technique. So when they drill an oil well, they want to be able, and it's successful, they want to be able to go to the next site over and drill another one and have it be successful too. So what they do is they find the producing horizons in the, in the geology and they just trace them from one place to another and hopefully drill a hole and hopefully it works or somebody gets fired. And, uh, and this, then that's what we do. So we correlate these things from place to place um, not using automated um, pattern matching techniques, but by eye, the same way the oil industry does it, because the human brain is actually far better at this than computers are. And so these red lines are the tie lines, supported by radiocarbon ages that you can't, can't really read from the back of the room. And so we correlated these things along the length of Cascadia and found out that uh, not only could you count down from the top and find the ash in the 13th, you could actually link individual beds because each one of them has sort of a fingerprint-like signature that you can trace from place to place. And so, for example, in the middle here, you see this core labeled hydrate ridge and this other one labeled rogue channel. You can see this big event. We call it T11. This event appears and looks more or less like that in every single Cascadia core up from Canada to, to Northern California. And so 
we were just surprised as heck to find out that you could actually kind of trace these fingerprints from pay, place to place. But this is exactly what the oil industry does. And so um, normally we do this kind of work in the deep sea on uh, uh, our preferred vehicle is something like this. This is the Tommy Thompson uh, UW ship. Uh, it's 270 or 80 feet long, has 10,000 meters of wire, and we can take cores in, in water depths up to five or 6,000 meters. And Cascadia is relatively shallow, shallow subduction zone, so we're only at 3,000 meters. But you need a, a fairly big boat to do this. On the other hand, Cascadia has a lot of lakes, and it turns out that had we known this earlier, we would have probably just done it this way. So this is a couple of Coleman canoes uh, strapped together with a piece of plywood, and you can go out to almost any lake in Cascadia and take hand-pushed cores, you know, the, the easy way version of the big ship, and get almost the exact same record. Spent a lot of time at sea, and I wish I'd known that. Not that it wasn't fun, but... And so now, in addition to the offshore evidence, we're working on a couple of um, transects, one through Seattle and one through Portland using Bull Run Lake, which is Portland's water supply, uh, to try to um, move this story inland, to kind of knit the story together. And you'll see in a minute that the story now between a lot of people working um, along the coast, not just in Willapaw Bay, but in every bay along the coast, and the offshore evidence makes a tight story one thing that's missing, though, is that all of our cities are way inland. So the evidence is out here, but the cities are inland. And so we would like to know, ideally, what's the ground shaking going to be like in Salem, Portland, Seattle, Victoria, Vancouver. And that's harder to get at. So you've got a 100-mile you know, difference between where the data is and where the, where the people are. And so these lake projects are, are trying to kind of fill that gap and see uh, how far it would, how hard it would shake this far inland, and so um, so these are just uh, I won't try to get into any detail, but so we've taken cores on opposite sides of Puget Sound, and we found we think we find the same sort of shaking signal. We seem to have similar number of events at about the same time. We have sort of a tentative linkage using the the industry logging technique to match them up from place to place. And an interesting th happen thing happened along the way. These co same lakes had been investigated previously by forest fire people. And they'd written papers on how this was all, these turbidites were a record of forest fires. So when you have a big fire, it, it raises the forest. A lot of sediment comes into a lake, and it carries charcoal with it. And that was their evidence. And, but it turned out they seemed to have forest fires at about the same time the offshore was having earthquakes. <laughs> and so kind of wondered, how does a forest fire start an earthquake or the other way around? And so it turns out that um, we took cores on opposite sides of Puget Sound, and there's 90 kilometers of water between these sites. So it's effectively, this sort of eliminated the forest fire hypothesis unless you had you know, 13 times in a row forest fires that were so big they were burning on both sides of Puget Sound at more or less the same time. So it seems less likely that these were caused by fires and more likely that um, the earthquake delivered both the fire evidence and the earthquake evidence at the same time. And that's why they match up. And so here's uh, Bull Run Lake here. Uh, this is uh, the Portland Water Bureau has been extremely helpful supplying barges and cranes and lots of people. The whole Portland water supply was built 1933 to 1936, fully 50 years before plate tectonics. And so it's very fragile. So even a small earthquake would basically shut down Portland's water supply. And so they're very, very uh, concerned about this. It was, um, it was a fun place to work. This has been fenced off. The Pacific Crest Trail is just across, along this saddle in the background. And this, but short of that, this whole area has been fenced off since the 30s, so it's sort of a de facto wildlife refuge. And we could work out there, and the deer would just kind of stroll up and go, hi, what are you doing? You know, there was not, no fear of people whatsoever. And so anyway, I've kind of, kind of taken a roundabout tour of, of some of the evidence for Cascadia Great Earthquakes. And so remember back in the, the paradigm change uh, Cascadia, people had kind of tippy-toed around Cascadia and went, well, we'll come back to that. It's not really making too much sense. But since that time, up till, from then till now, Cascadia has gone from essentially the worst known fault in the world to one of the best known faults in the world. 
And so many people have been sort of captivated by this bizarre subduction zone that makes no earthquakes. That part's never been explained <laughs> on a daily basis, but we know makes really big earthquakes on over long times, time scales and with big intervals in between. And so with so many people working on that question and trying to figure that out, Cascadia has now kind of leapt to the forefront as the best known fault in the world that hasn't had an earthquake in historic times. Um, or any fault for that matter. We still know this place better than we know the subduction zone in Japan. So if you take all that, all those wiggles and all those shovel diggings along the coast and kind of compile all that data, you can actually map out past earthquakes going back 10,000 years in considerable detail. And so if you can do that, why not make a movie out of it? And so this is Cascadia the movie, the last 43 Cascadia earthquakes, 10,000 years of record. Um, it's going to play at about 200 years a second. And uh, sorry, it doesn't have the rock in it or anything, or any music or anything like that. But anyway, uh, here it is. So we're starting back at 10,000 years and going forward in time. And so what you'll see is these red blobs are the blobs, uh, are the, the rupture area constrained by the the offshore and the onshore paleoseismology together as a, as a whole. And you'll see some are bigger and wider than others, some are limited to some certain areas, but there goes Mount Mazama 7,600 years ago. And this one is the biggest of them all, T11, the one that appears as a giant in every lake. And after T11, there was a thousand year gap where there was nothing going on in the north, but five small events happened in the south. So from this paleoseismology, we're starting to see some patterns, big ones, small ones, medium sized ones, segmented ones that appear only in the south and then full margin ruptures that go the whole way. And we also have a similar record for the northern San Andreas fault, which is this little yellow banana slug looking thing uh, down here, which you might notice is going off, maybe not coincidentally, about the same time as Cascadia. Let that sink in for just a sec. <laughs> so now we're down to the penultimate event, 480 years before present, and then uh, T1, what we call T1, the AD 1700, uh, earthquake, January 26, 1700. And so we had uh, the Japanese famous Hokusai print. Not, this is not the 1700 tsunami, but anyway, uh, it's always a nice picture. And then it turns out that as geologists started to figure this out, they realized that there were actually people here. The Native Americans were here and they have, they have oral histories that go back beyond Mount Mazama. They remember in their oral histories, the explosion of Mount Mazama. Just think about that for a second. And when this earthquake evidence started to come out, essentially some of the Native American tribes said, oh yeah, we knew about that. Why didn't you just ask us? <laughs> and they did. Only they didn't call it a great subduction zone earthquake. They called it the Battle of Thunderbird and Whale. And so two prominent gods of the time uh, in, in deep history had had a giant battle and during this giant battle for dominance of the two gods, Thunderbird and Whale thrashed around and there, were, uh, there was a lot of shaking of the ground, as you'd expect for a battle of the gods, and big waves that washed away villages. And so the Battle of Thunderbird and Whale uh, is, is repeated across, across tribes in the Northwest. It's not just one tribe. It's, many of them had a very similar story and not only did, was it a story, but it was a bit of a parable. The end of the, the, end of the story goes something like, in, in case this ever happens again, don't build your villages too close to the beach. So they not only knew about this, they knew what to do about it hundreds of years ago. So uh, if you take those 43 earthquakes and, and, and group them, they go something like this. We have about 19 that run most of the full length of the margin. We have a few that go a little short of that. Uh, half a dozen more that stop at about Astoria. Uh, several more that stop at about Newport. A whole bunch of them that are just limited to the south uh, 
these two segments here and just a single one that seems to be limited to just the Washington margin. So we know quite a bit about these things now and all the, all the black dots are the data site locations. And so, of course, everybody really wants to know what are the chances of this happening in my lifetime or next week or next month? And unfortunately, paleo seismology gets you basic statistics but doesn't predict anything. And, but these are the numbers here. So Washington margin, uh, the chances are 10 to 15% in 50 years. Uh, for latitude of Portland, about 15 to 22%. And for Coos Bay and Point South, uh, because you've got all of these smaller events, uh, the chances are 25 to 40 percent um, in the next 50 years. But these are not all the same. This is, this, this is the chance of any recordable, geologically recordable earthquake. These could be as low as high sevens, mid sevens for some of these smaller ones. So these numbers don't apply to magnitude nine. The, the 10 to 15 percent is the one that applies to the long ruptures magnitude nine. But still, if you live in Coos Bay and you get one of these, you're sure going to know about it. And uh, so <clears throat> even the smallest of these are roughly uh, low magnitude 8 range. Uh, the San Francisco earthquake of 1906 was a 7.9, so just to give you some, some reference points. So these are still, when I say smaller, I'm saying smaller in terms of subduction zone earthquakes. These are really still big earthquakes. And so if you have that good of a record, what else, what else can you do with it? Do they come, are they spread out evenly in time? Do they bunch up? What do they do? And so this is what the record looks like. This is uh, 10,000 years ago in the, uh, over here. Zero time, you are here. And so this is, the, and the height of the bar is roughly the size of the earthquake in some crude sense. And so you can see, pretty obviously, they are clustered. So we've had five earthquakes from, from 1,500 years ago to the last one. Uh, clumped together around 300 years apart and then a thousand year gap. And this is the big ones. This is not counting the, the smallish ones in southern Oregon. Then you've got a thousand year gap. Then you've got another cluster of five, a little bit more spread out for this cluster, but then another thousand year gap. And then it's a little less obvious what's going on back here. And this is just another different grouping of the way to think of that. So. So this makes uh, statisticians and probability, earthquake probability hazard people go crazy because this means that the basic statistics of recurrence, you can't use them at all. Because we have no idea if this cluster has one more left in it or we're due for a thousand year gap. And even if we did know, what would we do about it? How We would have to know it really, really well to base any policy on that. So. So this is just something that is the current white elephant. It's like, okay, this is data. We know that this is true. I, nobody can think of any way to use it for anything. Um, I'm kind of hoping for the thousand year gap <laughs> myself, because then I won't be here. And it'll take us about that long to make the Pacific Northwest resilient. So. <laughs> <clears throat> So now for the societal part of our <laughs> program. Um, to, to earthquake, or to scientists, earthquake, earthquakes are fun to work on. They're just a really big phenomena. They're just great fun. Some people don't s see it quite the same way we do, though. Um, so in... Um, I mentioned I was in uh, Japan in 2011, and I wasn't at these places. I was in a, I was further inland, so I didn't directly see these things happening. But um, it may sound really odd to say, but these horrendous pictures of the earthquake and tsunami, and uh, this is in Ishinomaki, Japan. Um, this is actually what success looks like. You think of it that way, Japan is the best pre prepared country on earth. They've been drilling and preparing and having you know, strong building codes and strong education programs and evacuation drills going back far back in time. And yet, this is still what happened. And so you can't prevent plate tectonics, you can't stop earthquakes, you can just prepare for them. And 
the only, the only thing you can say is they lost 20,000 people in Japan, but essentially in a similar sized earthquake as in uh, 2004 in Sumatra, they lost 10 times that many people around the Indian Ocean. So a quarter of a million people. And the difference was no education, no preparedness, no even understanding of what, what a tsunami was, that this could even happen around the Indian Ocean. And so as bad as this is, this is what success looks like in the best prepared country in the world. And so here we are in the Pacific Northwest. And the question is really, are we more like Japan or are we more like Indonesia? And we think of ourselves as a modern country. We, we, sometimes with some pride, we like to think of ourselves as the best country in the world. But in terms of earthquake preparedness, I can tell you we are Indonesia. We are not Japan. Um, we're not even close. If you look around, this is, a, this is an unreinforced masonry building. And our biggest problem is that all of our population centers, all of our cities were built after plate tectonics. So nobody's fault. It, it's just one of these things that, that happened. And so unreinforced masonry buildings means just basically brickwork. And you all know, you all have your favorite historic buildings that look like this. This is one of these little fracking earthquakes in the Midwest, a 4.4 earthquake, and this is what happens to the building. So these buildings are built to sustain gravity loads. That's the engineering term for it won't fall down by itself. They're, in, they're built to sustain wind loads, which means it won't blow over in a breeze, and, they're, and that's it. Um, they're highly susceptible to collapse under even light loading from earthquakes. And so, uh, so here we are, we have literally thousands of these buildings and an almost incalculable cost to start retrofitting the entire Pacific Northwest, which is eventually what, what's gonna have to happen. Um, the only question is, are we gonna do it before the earthquake or afterwards? And we have several hundred uh, bridges, about 300 bridges that some of these, to my mind, don't look like they would stand up in a strong breeze now. Um, so they don't do well in earthquakes. And we have a lot of drawbridges and, and things like that that have big, heavy counterweights, and they don't perform well in earthquakes either. So most of Oregon's building stock in terms of the bridges are, are, will be down uh, during the earthquake. And if you think about it, they'll be blocking the Columbia River as well, which is not a, um, not a good um, place to be when you're trying to recover. And then worst of all, maybe, is that we have about 1,000 unreinforced masonry schools in Oregon, 3,000 in the Pacific Northwest. We're retrofitting these now at an accelerated pace, which means about five a year. And so you can do the math. It's going to take a very long time to get this done. And so you know, kids, they're the only people that go to work who are, uh, don't have a choice about where they go to work. They go where we tell them to go. And it's presumably safe to go there. But in reality, it isn't. The vast majority of our schools are, are unsafe in earthquakes. And so, um, so I'd like to loop back to Japan. Uh, you could, I could show endless slides of Japan. And uh, what happened when we were there, I mentioned that we were changing speakers at a talk. We had 40 earthquake geologists there. The meeting was about the Sumatran earthquake, the big magnitude nine earthquake. We were in Kashiwa Chiba in Japan, which was thought to have a maximum earthquake size of about 8.4. There's a long story behind that, but that's what people thought at the time. So when we had this earthquake, um, it was actually the third earthquake of the week. We had one on Wednesday, and we had one on Thursday morning. And by the time we had one Friday afternoon, we're just kind of annoyed going, oh, God, we're going to have to evacuate, and then the meeting will go long, and we were looking forward to a nice big dinner. And, um, but this earthquake lasted about five minutes. And so uh, to an earthquake geologist, that immediately equates to magnitude nine. You don't have to think much, very hard about that. If it goes past a minute, you're above seven. If it goes past two minutes, you're into eight. If it gets to three minutes, you're probably hovering around nine. And if it makes it to four, you're definitely in a magnitude nine earthquake. So we just literally watched the time. We knew we were safe because it was Japan. The building was brand new, it was bulletproof. We didn't have to worry about a collapsing building, but we saw the time passing and, and knew that it was 
a paradigm-changing earthquake. Northeast Japan was having a magnitude 9. And after, the, after it was done, the aftershock started up right away, and we knew there would be a tsunami coming in. So we went to the cafeteria where they had a big screen TV, and we watched the tsunami roll in on NHK TV in real time. So that's when earthquakes stopped being fun. And uh, so here we are, a group of us, we're standing in front of the Ishinomaki Public Safety Building. And this is Mayor Sato of Ishinomaki. And um, we, uh, for, the, for the OPB program, Unprepared, spent an afternoon with uh, Mayor Sato. And he told us that in this building, which is the only building standing for quite a ways, this is where the town was, this meadow back here. He said there were something like 56 people uh, in this building, and their job was to broadcast tsunami warnings and to get the evacuation going, you know, on the radio, whatever media means that they had. Uh, somewhere around 45 uh, five of them died uh, when the building went under, and a few of them survived um, hanging on to the cell tower on top. And so here's Mayor Sato's selfie from without him in it of the town of Ashinomaki under 40 feet of water. And this is the railing of that building, and he's hanging on the cell tower. So, in the Pacific Northwest, we're kind of at a crossroads now. We, um, so from 1985, John Adams, up till the 90s when we knew uh, this magnitude 9 generated tsunami hit Japan on January 26. Up to now, we're having our own 30, 40 year-ish paradigm change of uh, coming to this realization that this isn't a bunch of tinfoil hat scientists making this up. This is real. We actually need to make decisions about what to do. And so we've, we've ramped up the rate of school retrofits. It's double or triple what it was, but it's still a long way from where it needs to be. Uh, Kids in Seaside started a GoFundMe campaign to move their school on the other side of Highway 101. Uh, they wanted $200 million, and they basically shamed the parents into passing a bond measure to get, it, to get it done. And so there's a lot of success stories. People are starting to build vertical evacuation structures, and the military is having uh, drills, big-scale drills with, like, aircraft carriers. I was, in, I was at South Beach Marina in Newport one day when a landing craft steamed into the steamed into the harbor and pulled up to the boat ramp and spit out some ambulances. And I, here I am, the earthquake guy. I'm going, what's going on? He goes, oh, they're having an earthquake drill. It's like, really? We looked offshore. There was an aircraft carrier out there that sent this landing craft in. And they were completely under the radar. It was unannounced, never appeared in the press. So there's a lot going on. Um, but we're not doing everything quite right. As, as, as we all know, when things get into the political realm, sometimes things go sideways and people fail to use the information that's out there. So my own school uh, is building a new marine science center on a sandbar in the, in the middle of the tsunami zone, which would be funny if it, you know, if it weren't true. And so um, the response of people to this issue is, it varies a lot. Mayor Sato, when we drove into a Shinomaki, we saw them helicopter logging the hills around the town and strip mining the hills around town. We thought, what a funny thing to be doing. Why are they worried about logging when they have, their town's been destroyed? And so they'd, they'd had the town sort of, the business sector kind of in tents up on a hill. And so we, we drove around kind of wondering about this, this and we asked Mayor Sato, what's, what's going on? And he goes, oh, well. We are logging the hillside and we are strip mining uh, the materials to bring down. We're going to raise the base level of the town four meters above the reach of tsunamis and put the town back on top. So that's Japan's response to a tsunami. Their, Mayor Sato, he was a child when the, uh, the uh, 1960 Chile tsunami rolled in. And it was a great party. Everybody thought it was fun. It was only about 30 centimeters high. And the scientists. Subsequently, so fast forward now, he's mayor of this town. He's 60-something years old. And the scientists had said, don't worry. It's only going to be a five or six meter tsunami. Shinomaki will be fine. And what they got was a 15 meter tsunami that just took the town off the map. So Mayor Sato said, 
I don't listen to scientists much anymore. We're simply going to make the towns safe from tsunamis forever. And that's what they're doing. In the Northwest, we're doing some pretty odd things like building in tsunami zones. We're not, and OSU is not the only one. The Gold Beach Hospital was put back in the tsunami zone and a few other things. Um, so, but this is one of the most blatant, bizarre things that, I'm, that I can think of. So the, the, the entire Earth Science Department and I have been in a knockdown, drag out fight with President Ed Ray of OSU about this thing. And uh, they decided to go ahead with it anyway. So groundbreaking is in a couple of months and uh, uh, there we have it. So this, uh, oh, the, the other thing is we, uh, Dogami, the, the Oregon State uh, Department of Geology, um, put together a sort of a world-class group and uh, to model tsunamis along the Oregon coast. So we actually know that when the wave uh, hits the New Marine Science Center, it's going to be going. It's going to be around the, the maximum height, which is what they're going to build to. Uh, we'll be going around 26 knots, which is 30 miles an hour. It's not going to be a simple, just uh, a, a low amplitude wave and rising water. It's going to be actually a breaking wave, uh, going 26 knots, and it's going to be 27 feet high, which is about somewhere near the height of this building. So anyway, sometimes you can take good science and use it the right way, and sometimes you can just ignore it. And, uh, so I'll just end there, and I hope we still have some time for questions. No? <laughs> I wish we could stay longer, but we have to go to lunch, and oh, I can't sorry. thank you enough for scaring us to death. Okay, thanks, Anne. <laughs>